Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtual NBC6 Voices on our Facebook and YouTube pages. I'm Jawan Strader. A lot to get to in our show tonight. 330 days ago, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. Tonight, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is behind bars. A jury says that he's guilty on all three charges. He faced second-degree murder, third-degree murder, and second-degree manslaughter. Two and a half hours ago, most of us were on pins and needles waiting for the verdict, but the guilty verdicts were a sort of vindication. The kind that Emmett Till, Chino Castile, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Breonna Taylor, and countless others never saw. The question tonight is, what does this justice look like? Let's break it all down and what this all means for us tonight. Please welcome former state attorney, Melba Pearson, she's now with the uh, Director of Policy and Programs for FIU's Center for the Administration of Justice. Also, please welcome community activist Tiffy Burks. She also joins us now a little bit more. She was hitting the pavement out there last summer with many protesters uh, after what happened to George Floyd. And we also have two others that will be joining us later on in the program. So let's start off that question. Let's start off the same question for the both of you. Melba, let's hear from you. Uh, what's your reaction to the verdict? So my initial reaction was one of relief. Um, commenting not only as an attorney and a former prosecutor, uh, but also as an African-American woman. And, you know, seeing the verdict, first of all, I was on pins and needles as if I had tried the case. So it was a very familiar feeling. But this, this case is so important to the history of our country. As we talk about what policing is going to look like moving forward, what activism is going to look like going forward, what accountability is going to look like, this case is very pivotal in all of that. So I was very relieved to see a guilty verdict, but of course, this is one victory in a war, right? We've won a battle, but we have not won the bigger war around making sure that the justice system works equally and equitably for everyone, and that bad actors, especially those that wear a badge, are held accountable. Uh, because for too long, as you stated in your opening comments, Jawan, we're talking centuries of bad actors being able to function with impunity. And now, today, we saw a distinct shift in the way policing is going to be handled moving forward. Well, Tiffy, I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts, especially after hearing the verdict? Um, you know, I'm thinking about how I got radicalized. I got radicalized in 2013 after George Zimmerman was actually acquitted um, of killing Trayvon Martin. So we've definitely made a lot of strides from 2013 to now. But I have to be honest with you, Juwan, I'm not satisfied, right? You know, we're thinking about justice in this country. Um, George Floyd should still be alive, right? So as somebody who organizes with the Black Lives Matter Alliance Broward, we're actually calling for abolition, right? We want the police departments that, you know, killed George Floyd, Adam Toledo, um, Dewan Wright, locally, James Leatherwood. We want those police departments to be defunded, right? Because um, we know that that's what's going to lead to true justice. Because otherwise, you know, um, we're going to see what has happened in the past where, you know, um, police departments are going to use this to pacify us and um, funnel more money into police departments for training. Um, but we've seen already um, across the country that more money um, being funneled to police departments still ends um, in more um, police violence and police murders like what happened to George Floyd. So um, we want to actually see abolition. We want to see the police department that defunded, I mean, the police department that killed George Floyd to be defunded, um, not only there, but locally here as well, too. So okay. I'm not satisfied. Well, Tiff, you talk about being defunded, but let's say that that doesn't work. And, mm -hmm. and this is to the both of you, because there is a George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that is out there. Uh, Tiffy, would you be pleased if this act uh, is to get passed? Now, of course, it has some tough hurdles, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to it, but but this is basically will make it easier to prosecute police officers in the future, among other things, as well as uh uh, uh, ending racial profiling and changing the culture of law enforcement. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, again, I have to be completely honest with you, Juwan. Yeah. Um, those things are, 
you know, good. But if we're talking about true justice and true accountability, um, that looks like what um, protesters across the country call for after um, George Floyd was killed um, here locally in South Florida and across the world, which is the actual defunding um, and reallocation of resources to say that we could envision a world um, um, that is radically different than the one that we have right now with current policing. So um, again, those measures are good, but we're looking for things that actually lead to the abolition of policing in the future um, and really saying that it's a true pathway to true healing, true um, justice, and true transformation of our current system that we have here today. Okay, Melba, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think that the George Floyd Act would be a solid first step. But, you know, I want to caution everyone because at the end of the day, if we think through the Kerner Commission report from the 60s, says the same exact thing as the uh, 21st Century Commission on Policing, which was convened under President Obama. And so that was around 2016 to today. It was always about training. It's about de-escalation. All of these tactics have been around for decades and departments as a whole have not necessarily availed themselves of those resources. So definitely a more bold and drastic approach needs to be taken with regards to making sure that bad actors are weeded out of the system. And most importantly, once they are either convicted or there was an internal investigation that shows they were acting in a way that was incompatible with police values and what the community wants to see, they they get decertified and are never able to be a police officer anywhere else in the country again. Because what we end up seeing is that, okay, you know, somebody did something wrong. All right, we'll let you resign. But then they're able to go to the next jurisdiction over, the next mm -hmm. county over, and continue working and then potentially abuse the residents of that particular county. So we definitely need to see greater accountability, but we can't keep recycling the same things we've been talking about for decades as if it's brand new and hope for a different outcome. We need to definitely, you know, be much more aggressive in the way that we handle bad actors in the criminal uh, in the criminal justice system, especially those that wear a badge. Okay, well, Melba, let's go back to the trial. And could you critique the job of Derek Chauvin's defense team? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the Constitution entitles you to a, a defense. You're not entitled to a winning defense or a good defense. And in this particular situation, I mean, he worked with, I guess, what they thought they could work with, but, you know, to basically say and, and defy all of the science and say that uh, George Floyd died of a drug overdose when that clearly was not the case. And then you have the video of him being on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. I mean, that, that flies in the face of common sense. So, you know, again, he probably put the best he could together, but... <laughs> just it doesn't pass the spell test, right? Like when I was a prosecutor, I would always use a jury of non lawyers, right? So I would talk to my mom, and then you know, once I got married, I would run my theories of a case by my husband. And if they're like, mm, that doesn't make sense, then I know a jury is not going to think it made sense either. He would have best been served if he spoke to somebody that was not involved in law enforcement or not involved in the justice system to kind of float that theory by them to see if that made sense. And they hopefully would have told him, no, you need to come up with a different defense. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. And, and Tiffy, Tiffy, I want to get to you because it, it's interesting. We heard from the Att Minnesota Attorney General, Keith Ellison, and he, he, he was speaking and crediting those as he said, that were on scene that day, that day last May. And he said, some brave people who pressed record on their cell phone, he credited mm -hmm. those brave people. And he said, they stopped and raised their voices because they knew it was wrong. How important is that to helping to change, um, I, I would say, uh, I, I don't know about laws, but helping to bring some of these things uh, into play because before, see, w without cameras, when I grew up, it was like my word against somebody else's word. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. how important is that? And and how important is that to you as a as someone who is marching and trying to get your point across? 
It's so important because when you think about it, it's exactly what you said. A lot of times, and we know um, in this case with George Floyd, if there wasn't, you know, those young people who were recording um, and if it wasn't blasted across the country and has gone viral, we know that the police departments would have done what they have historically done and pretty much, you know, you know, made themselves not guilty in this um, case. But I think anybody with two eyes who watched that video know that this was a clear murder of George Floyd. And so it's so important. And it even reminds me of even the local cases with DeLuca Roll who went viral. Um, and that's because there was somebody who was videotaping it and it went viral on social media. So um, people and citizens who are there, who are doing the videos, we need that to continue to happen because we know police violence is not going to end and here. Um, we need that to continue to happen because honestly, the court of public opinion um, and everybody watching it across the country um, was also what led to this decision being made. So it's so important to have that evidence because every single time the police officers are going to put themselves on trial, they are going to find themselves not guilty. And having those videos is really um, something that is powerful for the movement and powerful for transformation and seeing true justice happen. Um, because otherwise we know what the results would have been if there was no video in the um, case of George Floyd. Mm, very good point. And, and, and Melba, someone who is an attorney, uh, for, you know, who, who worked in a state attorney's office, how important is it to have video? Because now you see this all the time, someone pulling out their cell phone and hitting record Whereas before you didn't see that as much. And, and now we have that. And I wish we would have had that in so many other cases that we've had to deal with in the past. But how important is that? I think one that the cell phone <clears throat> You know, footage is a game changer. I think it's incredibly important, but I also have to caution folks to say, oh, if you have cell phone footage, automatically that will result in a guilty verdict. We unfortunately saw in the George Zimmerman case in the murder of Trayvon Martin that there was, you know, basically video available. And what ends up happening, and, you know, over the course of the trial, the jurors got very desensitized with mm -hmm. regards to, you know, hearing this over and over again. So so cell phone video in and of itself is not going to necessarily, you know, result in a guilty verdict, but it is a critical piece of evidence that forms the building blocks for a case that could be prosecuted successfully. And, you know, I think Will Smith was the one who, who made this comment that, listen, you know, police brutality and those sorts of issues have been happening for centuries. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's gotten worse. It's just that now it's being recorded and now being disseminated on social media and, and in mainstream media. So people are getting more awareness, right? So that that's a positive of it. But at the end of the day, we need those videos to be able to build our case and really show the jury from the different angles goals, you know, that the officer used excessive force. And had those witnesses not used that footage, but provided that footage, we would have been maybe in a different situation now. However, in this case, we did have the body cam footage. And that's another aspect that I definitely want to highlight moving forward, mm. that all police departments in the United States need to be mandated. It needs to be mandatory that every single department has body worn cameras on each of their officers, has clear protocols as to when and how the body cams must be turned on. And also they should have dash cam video as well so that you know, you're know you getting every single angle. And again, you can vindicate an officer if they acted appropriately, but if they didn't, you have the evidence to be able to hold them accountable and not have a your word versus their word type situation. Okay, now, uh, Tiffy and uh, Melba, I want to ask you about sentencing. Uh, we're about eight weeks from sentencing. So, Tiffy, I got to ask you this because we always hear someone can face up to, and Melba will be able to speak about this. So, up to, but it's never usually the max. What are you, okay, so I know you're pleased with the outcome, with the verdict, but what about the sentencing part? Um, will you be pleased if he gets, say, 30 years, if he gets 25, if he gets, you know, 40? 
what will please you as far as sentencing is concerned? And then Melba, I want you to add to this, and then we're gonna bring Marwan Porter, a civil rights attorney, into the discussion. Oh, Tiffy, you're muted. My bad. Sorry. Oh, about no, that. it's all good. <laughs> um, so this is a very good question because you know, this when we talk about sentencing. Um, and you talk about being an abolitionist, which, you know, is somebody who truly believes in the abolition of policing and the abolition of prisons. Um, it's hard to say, you know, like what sentencing um, is going to bring peace, right? Because we know that true justice looks like the abolition of um, policing and prisons. But we know that I'm just speaking from a community level. Um, you know, there is going to be an uproar if, you know, um, Derek does not get the sentencing that people feel like he deserved, which is probably going to be the maximum. We know that there's going to be an uproar in community um, as a result of that. But again, if we're looking for true justice, we're looking for things that can actually transform policing. So I have to be really honest um, in the sentencing um, equation. I'm not really going to be you know, paying attention to that. And it's not because I don't want true justice and it's not because I don't care for true liberation. But I know that that is a distraction from the true goal which is talking about how do we actually build systems that can lead to true justice. And that will look like, again, and I'm just going to beat this over until it's like a dead horse, but that actually looks like how do we actually define um, the police department that killed George Floyd. And so that will look like true justice to me. So if we could have that conversation or hear those things in addition to his sentencing, then I think that that could lead to true transformation. But I know community is going to want him to um, actually serve his maximum. So I'm here, again, as an organizer, <laughs> to do what the community wants as 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 we're working towards these longer goals um which is abolition so all right you. no 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 and that's fair and and, and melba i want to hear from you because you you you've seen these play out before you've seen these movies before where someone there's a verdict reached they're found guilty and then boom and then you hear the sentencing and it shocks everyone that's the next big thing i think a lot of people are looking forward to yeah, yeah. So under Minnesota law, um, the he's found guilty of three charges. And in this scenario, the charges do not run consecutively. So he faces the maximum on the highest charge, which is second degree murder. He faces a maximum of 40 years in prison. Now, to your earlier point, Juwan, just because you face 40 years doesn't mean you get 40 years. There's right. something called sentencing guidelines where the basically there's a, it depends on it varies from state to state. Uh, but what ends up happening is that it's basically a formula that takes into consideration your past conduct contact with the criminal justice system, you know, any aggravators or, you know, any other was a weapon used, that sort of thing. And then a number is formulated. And so many times someone who has no criminal histories like Jarek Chauvin, you know, might end up with a, a minimum of maybe five years or seven years, you know, depending again on what their formula is like and the types of things that they take into consideration. However, the prosecution in this case files a motion citing aggravating circumstances to ask the court to be able to depart from that minimum. So in other words, the prosecution is intending on asking for a much higher sentence than the minimum of the guidelines would provide. So we could end up seeing this, the prosecution, the state in this case, asking for a sentence of 30 years, 35 years, because part of the reason that they filed this motion was because Derek Chauvin conducted this murder in the presence of children and in the presence mm. of a So that sort of trauma and that mm. sort of horror that these children are now going to be having nightmares and all of that, that is one of the key reasons that the prosecution filed this motion for an enhanced sentence. So it's not going to exceed 40 years, but we can, I would, if I was betting, if I had to guess, I would think that the prosecution is going to ask for something in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 years in prison. Interesting. Okay, we're going to bring Marwan Porter into this discussion. Marwan Porter is a civil rights attorney. He joins us now uh, live with more. Marwan, I've, I've asked your, uh, your panelists, your colleagues this question already, but I want to get your thoughts on the verdict. Yeah, I think that it was a long time coming. Um, I can't say 
that uh, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a little bit shocked. I, I am shocked. Uh, and, and it's simply because we've had these type of heinous crimes committed against our communities for many, 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 many years, uh, say 400 years, and uh, we've had no accountability. And today um, is, is a historic day uh, because I think it marks the first step of creating systemic change uh, uh, and reaching towards justice. Today is not justice. Today is simply accountability. Um, justice is changing the system of policing, um, of policies and procedures across the country that deals with how um, our communities are policed. And so we have to deal with the root. Uh, and, and the root is the systems that are in place, which make individuals like Officer Chauvin and many, many, many others believe that they could, you know, murder people uh, and, and not be held accountable. So I'm elated. Um, I, I think that today is is not only um, uh, a step towards justice, but it's a step towards healing, uh, uh, not only for, for black folk, but for everybody. Uh, because when you're wrong, you're wrong. And you know you're wrong. You know, when they stole black people from Africa and brought them to uh, America and split, you know, children from their mothers and fathers and and wives from their husbands. Um, when they they raped, you know, women and and hung, you know, uh, little boys from trees and had picnics. You know, everyone knew it was wrong. In their heart of hearts, you would have to think, from a humanity standpoint, that wow, this is wrong. And then you go through this psychological transformation. You know, called confirmation bias or cognitive dissonance to make one uh, feel justified in their conduct. But it's evil and it's perverted and it's crooked. And I think it destroyed many white people over, you know, the 400 years um, that we've been subject to this. So when you get this type of accountability and justice, not only does it cause healing for people of color, but it causes healing for all people, um, you know, white and black alike. So I think today is really, really, really big. And as one of the young ladies said, uh, um, you know, technology, you know, thank, thank God for technology uh, because, you know, without, I mean, technology is almost like the vaccine that we are using for, for COVID, you know, technology has allowed us to see and allow the world to see what black people and people of color in this country have been complaining about for many, many, many years. Um, and the general public uh, in the world would, would uh, tend to defer to law enforcement. Um, but now with it live and in color, in your face, you know, nine minutes and counting, um, you know, the United States was on trial because the world was watching. And it's unfortunate, uh, but it took the world watching for, for um, this verdict, I believe, to come down the way it came down. Um, because everyone knew that was dead wrong. And if for some reason it went any other way, it would have been a problem for humanity. So. So I'm elated, uh, and I'm elated not only for generations of brutality and and uh, um, and just you know immorality, uh, but I'm elated for us as as a human race because I think we're gonna build from here. Okay. I, I can't Here we go. I'm the one that yeah. was muted. Okay, Marwan, yeah. if you get a chance, if you get a chance, Marwan, speak up a little bit louder so sure. um, everyone can hear you just a little bit louder. But I have to ask you, Marwan, when you think about uh, Eric Garner, when you think about Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Brianna Taylor, uh, Philando Castillo, um, Emmett Till, 
And what this means and this verdict means for all of those that happened in the past where many felt that there was no justice. Can you tell me what this means, this verdict means? You know, it, it, again, I think it means, you know, we have turned the corner. Um, I think all of those individuals you named are smiling in heaven um, because we have turned the corner and it wasn't an easy corner to turn. It was a very, very difficult corner to navigate and to turn. But it, it, it means that we could start healing. This country could start healing. You know, uh, um, being held accountable and taking responsibility for one's actions is what starts the long process of healing. Otherwise, you just are continuing to pour salt in a wound. And so I think that all of those individuals who have died um, at the hands of law enforcement are smiling down and we feel their spirits and we feel their souls um, um, for, for minorities in this country, for our children uh, and for humanity um, in general. All right, Marwan Porter, thank you so much. As you said, we can start healing as a country, uh, as a people. Thank you so much for joining us on NBC Six Voices. Tiffy, thank you. Uh, Melba, thank you as well. That's our show for tonight. You can watch this program Saturday morning on NBC Six at 9.30. Be sure to follow me on Instagram and Facebook. I'm at Jawan NBC Six. And you can also message us if you have a story idea. And before we go, remember, education is the key to success. If you believe, you will succeed. We'll see you next time. Have a great week.